Assalamualaikum and welcome to another episode of the Y Factor listeners. Today is Thursday the 27th of June and we're here for a live Y Factor episode. On the mic you've got Tasneem joined by Miran. And the really exciting thing is this is like the second last week before Ramadan. That's right. So inshallah we'll go through the usual jazz this week but uh, hopefully next week we'll have a special episode planned for you um, and some heartfelt Ramadan uh, reminders just before Ramadan does actually start. So we'll, d- uh, we'll be sure to have that going. Now there's a lot to talk about in the news section, right? You know, political turmoil ha- has actually hit the country. So we, what, we, uh, what we might um, do is actually get a journalist this time, a, a real journalist, not you, Miran. We're going to be a real professional professional and interview someone else and I'm going to let that slide because it's been a long day but anyway um, a journalist to discuss yesterday's amazing events drum rolls for the journalist ABC journalist Mohammed Taha is joining us on the program welcome to the show Taha hi guys Okay, well, nice to go from Y Factor host to um, ABC journalist, and we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but for those who were living un- under a rock last night, tell us what happened. Well, it was probably the political groundhog day of Australia's history. It was massive, like an unprecedented 48 hours of politics. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kevin Rudd is now the PM, officially sworn in this morning by the Governor General. Um, last night, there was a ballot vote in the Labour caucus, and he won, so Gillard has retired. Um, There was speculation from about a week ago that um, Labour caucus members were going to make a move. It finally happened yesterday, much to many people's disappointment on the same night of origin, Um, but it it happened. It happened right before it actually started, Um, and you can sort of tell people's sentiments on Facebook. It was funny watching the priorities. I mean, in every household, I can assure you there was a tug of war over the remote control. Who's watching Origin and who's watching Caucus? Although there was one random person complaining that MasterChef was being put on hold and we're like... Where did MasterChef even come into the debate here? But, you know. Well, it was interesting because when Kevin Rudd was supposed to say his speech, he just kept delaying it. And everybody, you know, that 15 minutes, was it just to get the end of origin in or did he really, it's you know? because he's a Queenslander. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's a Queenslander at heart. It was interesting, though. If you had two TVs, you could have managed. But, yeah, yeah I think I think families were, were at war as well um, during last night. But, yeah, it was a very eventful night in politics. I don't, I've never seen, I don't know if you girls have as well, but this level of, of interest in politics ever. Mm. I think it's interesting because you have the very, you know, trivial interest from people that are like, oh, I didn't like what Julia Gillard wore, I'm glad she's out, right? Um, to the actual real, you know, deep political insight into, you know, the power brokers and the backbenchers and, you know, what it might mean for the loyalties across, across Labour and how this might actually impact them in the next election. So do you think, Taha, that this kind of reshuffle at this stage was maybe a strategic move to get their head Yeah, it was. I order? mean... I think I think Bill Shorten's move yesterday was was monumental. In, in obviously he he was he was instrumental in getting rid of Rudd when he got voted as PM, right, and put Gillard in her place. Um, Rudd generally isn't liked in Parliament. He's a, he's a people's choice by default. Opinion polls have shown that, but he's not liked. He's a, he micromanages. He doesn't give responsibility or he doesn't allow responsibility to his ministers. Um, apparently, he's a changed man, as many caucus members have said, especially ones who held strong views against him. But I think for the Labour Party, and I watched the interview of Tony Jones and Foreign Minister Bob Carr, because I was interested to see what Bob Carr says in all of this. He was saying, um, for the greater good of the Labour cause and the Labour Party, what happened yesterday or last night had to be done. Now, everyone knows that Labour is going to lose by landslide victory to the coalition come September or August. Um, depending on what this Rudd decides. Yeah. I think for, for Labor, they have a lot of factional problems and they need to sort out their own, you know, the in-house Rivalry. dramas that they have. Yep. Yeah, they, they really need to sort that out. But for them, I, I think from their point of view, they're thinking they don't want to lose as badly with Rudd because they do know that, he, that he's the people's choice. And I know opinion polls are hypotheticals, but he mm. did give, you know, stimulus packages to people. And people remember him for that. I have friends who aren't even politically engaged and they prefer Rudd over Gillard um, simply because 
he gave them money when he was prime minister. But is it so, really that you know that smiley face of Rudd or the actual breakthrough policies that you know Gillard brought with her? You know they were saying she's actually one of the few prime ministers post post World War, right, to introduce that many policies in that very short period. So we can you know analyze her on whether or not her partner is gay, whether her you know jackets are nice, all we like, and whether you know cut, you know Rudd has a cuter face. But at the end of the day, when we're talking real political analysis of their policy. Who who has who's been the one that's been pushing the policies through, and if Labour does you know swap I guess the face of the party, what happens to these policies that have been pushed through? At the end of the day, you know, um, are we really going to reverse our stand on the carbon tax, for example, or the disability scheme just because the face of Labour has changed? Yeah, that's a very good point, and I think people lose sight of that fact, Tasnim. Gillard's legacy is incredible. Besides from being the first ever you know female PM in the country's history. She has set a lot of incredible policies, and her achievements are vast. Talk about the NBN, um, setting up the labor economy, the disability um, policies, Gonski school funding reforms, you know, unprecedented in our education reform history, foreign policy, um, the carbon price or carbon tax, depending on what it's your really political It's really quite unfortunate is. that all of her achievements were overshadowed by, you know, really mediocre analysis constantly over, you know, the way she looks or, or the way she dresses or the fact that she was a woman and so on. Um, I wonder if Rudd would ever face the same amount of censure. I mean, say what you like about Julia Gillard and there definitely was a, a wide tide of people yesterday expressing opinions of, of joy that she was leaving parliament. But at the end of the day, she did make a difference. Like you're mentioning, so many reforms and policies right there that they'll be bringing to the elections. And the important thing to remember is that no matter who's at the helm of the Labour Party, what you vote for is the Labour Party or the Liberal Party. You're not voting for Rudd. You're not voting for Gillard. They could change the Prime Minister yet again after elections. Yeah, that's, that's not who right. we're picking. Yeah. And I think it's sad as well, Ryan, that our level of political engagement, or I, th- I think a lot of it is, has to do with media coverage. It's been really poor. I remember there was a period where there, there was a, a literally a weak focus on what jackets or what she was wearing. Yeah. Um, it's sad, and I do I do think there is a sense of um, misogyny in some reporting and the, the fixation on her gender and her playing the gender card or just her appearance would, wouldn't have happened to any other PM. And I think. People mm-hmm. know that. Annabelle Crabb spoke very passionately about it yesterday on ABC mm-hmm. News 24, saying that no other PM has went through so much scrutiny in all her years. And I think it's a bit sad for her not to see, well, not to finish her prime ministership. I mean, even if she did lose in the election, which, mm-hmm. which everyone knew, it would have been good if she ended on that note, as opposed to being ousted by factional... Um, you know, faceless men. Then again, as a lot of people are reminding everybody every couple of minutes, that is the way she got into power in the first place. So, yeah. But right. I guess the point is, um, regardless of her policies, how she got into power, how she got out of power, our previous point was why be fixated on her persona as a person, on the fact that she was a female, on her jackets, on her partner and things like that. That level of vitriol was never directed at any male yeah, prime absolutely. minister, no matter what his policies, no matter what his stance, you know. And I mean, so I think that's the problem that people have um, an issue with. And it's interesting to see the coverage internationally, right? Because um, if you just compare, you know, the way the UK uh, compared it uh, in, in their Telegraph to, um, you know, Wall Street, the Times, and even, you know, in Gardner and stuff like that, it's... You you know, internationally, people are kind of like, oh, wow, you know, this is like of Shakespearean quality, you know, <laughs> uh, being, you know, being slain, I guess. And some others were kind of like, you know, the people's man is back in power. So, Taha, as you're mentioning, it's actually really interesting to see the international covers, coverage versus the domestic coverage. I have to say, Australia has a history of having these big bang moments, you know, like Gough Whitlam. Remember that? You were saying earlier yeah. it's never, it's been unprecedented, but I'm sorry, Mohammed, I'm going to disagree with you there. I reckon the whole Gough Whitlam saga was probably on the same level, if not higher in terms of drama in Australian media at the time. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess from, from looking at, uh, she's the first ever female PM, but I think the, the uh, Gough Whitlam had, you know, that, that saga was pretty prominent. This ongoing rift between Gillard and Abbott, uh, sorry, Gillard and Rudd and their supporters for the past three years has been, it's, honestly, it's worked to Tony Abbott's advantage. He has played negative politics um, to the T, to the and he's been a very effective opposition leader. I, dis, I don't think he's brought out any good policy, and Bob Carr said that. 
now attention will fall on Tony Abbott with, OK, you've been attacking Gillard for the past three years and you were attacking Rudd before that. What good policy plans do you have in place when you become PM? Um, what is your policy plan for asylum seekers or, you know, climate change? Um, so attention will be diverted to that. But I think it was interesting as well, as mentioned yesterday, Gillard was brought in because of the polls and popularity, not about policy. So mm-hmm. I think she can tick the policy box. Rudd's always had popularity on her. He's had popularity on Abbott either. I don't think many people want Tony Abbott to be PM. That's just my personal view. Mm. Um, but I, I, I want a little that. bit of bias coming through there, Mr. <laughs> ABC journalist. No, but I think I actually um, I'm really lo- looking forward to see um, how things are going to play out, especially in relation to asylum seekers, because um, Chris Bowen has become um, has taken the Treasury portfolio. So it'd actually yeah. be interesting to see who's going to take um, the immigration and citizenship portfolio, um, and yeah. how that's going to impact you know their stance. Because at the end of the day, you know after 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 a week of this, the hype is going to die down about you know Julia and uh, and Kevin Rudd, but what it's, what what is going to remain is the policies that people have a question with, and that's what hopefully we would bring to election time. We don't yeah. even know when the election date is going to be anymore because Kevin Rudd has indicated today that he will not stick with the election date that was chosen by Julia Gillard, so that's a bit of a wait and see game as well happening, but. Anyways, thank you for the fantastic um, news wrap and analysis there, Mohammed Taha. Um, it does bring us, though, to a really sad part of our interview with you today. And it's still sort of really weird interviewing our co-host. <laughs> but, you know, um, we do have a little bit of a sad announcement. Shall we say it or shall you? You can say it. I'll do the honours. <laughs> She's so excited. <laughs> no problems. Okay, so Taha, um, as many of you would know, was one of our founding members of the Y Factor. So we've been on air about three years now. And he, it was um, the idea that, you know, Miran brought to him. He was, I guess, you know, the, the person who supported her all along um, and started it was the main catalyst. Now, after three long years, Taha has actually... Um, what would you say? Uh, opened his abdicated wing. his throne, <laughs> <laughs> um, and is coming out um, for better and greater things. And um, it's time that he actually does accept his job as an ABC journalist. And unfortunately for the for us, that means he might have to leave the Y Factor. So for all our listeners who are, you know, Avatar fans, um, this is a moment where we are on air to say officially goodbye to him. We wanted to appreciate you for all the um, amazing work you did put into the show. It was three years of sometimes, you know, sleepless nights, crazy meetings, um, last minute interviews, but you did pull your way. And I think um, on behalf of the team, and I can probably say so on behalf of our listeners, you were a great contribution to the Y Factor. We loved having you on um, as a part of the team and having you on air. And we do hope hope um, we do wish you the best for the future Um, we wish you the best for your endeavors and we do hope that you know your presence with us is always there as you know the patriarch that will just never leave (laughs) (laughs) just as an incredible farewell speech that's him i really appreciate it (laughs) that's you know it's really emotional i hope our listeners out there are feeling the emotion as we announce this breaking news right now but really mohammed um you know we're so proud that you're moving on to something like your position at the abc which is going to be um, an asset to both your career and to your contribution to the Muslim community as well inshallah like it's so good to see Muslims up there getting to places via their own hard work and hard effort and the more we're present in the media the more we have that representation I think the less at the end of the day we're going to be complaining hopefully about the um, the lack of representation if we could put it that way so, yeah exactly um Oh, I really appreciate it. It's been an incredible three years, as Tasneem mentioned. Um, it is a bit sad. I was just scrolling through, our, I think, our first episode, Moran, on YouTube. Yeah. I think it's our second episode. I don't think we uploaded our first one. Because it was such a disaster, um, you probably relegated yeah. it to... It was like test yeah. episode, right? We're probably too nervous. But um, as it's funny, it's funny, we've come a really long way. And the moment you approached me with that idea, um, I had a feeling it would work. And now, look at it, like you guys are doing an incredible job and the Facebook page is nearing 2,000 members, you know, a mini Facebook army. It's an incredible feat. Um, the YouTube channel, I, I love how dynamic the show is. Um, that's one, one of my, probably one of my favorite memories of the show would probably be how dynamic it was. If you scroll through the YouTube videos on the, on the Y Factors YouTube channel, look at the different titles of the episodes. Like, we've spoken about everything. I don't think we've covered, um, we haven't covered there isn't a topic we haven't covered. Hamza, um, we tried our best to have a massively cover, um, you know, a broad range of 
topics across the archive and if anyone does want to look up any of our past episodes they're pretty much all still up there on YouTube but Mohammed, what are your aspirations now like what do you think that you've learnt from the Y Factor that you're taking away with you? Well like anything community radio is a probably the best foundation for any young broadcaster, or announcer or journalist out there, community, anything. So doing this with you guys, starting out with you, Miranda, and Tasneem jumping on board, Musa Parishwani, Zainab and Jamal Rathbone, um, it's been incredible. I, I, you know, the, the experience in community radio is invaluable. I've learned so much, my interviewing technique, hunting down stories, chasing down talent, um, the technical side of things, knowing how to manage a studio, how to screen calls when they come in. All that sort of stuff, you, it's literally, each of those different skills are, is a course at the ABC or at a media outlet. But I've learned that just by doing it the week in, week way. out, volunteering week in, week out. <laughs> Learning it the I'm hard way, Taha, hey? Yeah, we, we have. There are a fair few bloopers to see. I'm not sure you want to mention them on air, but um, I think it's important with, with the learning process. But I've learned so much. It's, it's a stepping stone, as many people have said. Um, and I'm proud. I'll always be a supporter of this program. Um, I think it's an incredible show. And my hope for the Y Factor is that it grows into a safe space for Australian Muslims of all persuasions and, and levels of religiosity to post, discuss, and have robust conversation about anything, news issues, topics that matter to them. Let the Y Factor be a safe space for them to do that online and let the, the radio program be a good soundboard um, to interview incredible guests. We've had comedians, scholars, people from all over the world come on the program. So I've had a fascinating time. It's been a really amazing time and I've learned so much and it's probably something I'll never forget. And inshallah, one day I do, if you talk about my aspirations, run, I do want to end up, inshallah, reporting to Al Jazeera or the BBC. I will never forget where I came from. Um, Don't worry, when we, when we interview as a guest host, like a professional guest host, right, we'll remind you that, you know, this were, these were your foundations. So don't fret, Taha. We've, we've They're got like, Mohamed Taha, Al Jazeera, formerly of the Y Factor. <laughs> Don't worry, we won't forget, Taha. Look, thank you so much for your kind words. And I think they are um, uh, words, I guess, for our listeners in terms of what we are aiming to provide as a show, um, not just the radio show in terms of the radio segment, but as you said, the Facebook platform, the YouTube clips, Instagram and things and like that our aims like this is the point of the why factor so hopefully um, for all of us for you Muhammad for all our listeners and for the team itself only you know upwards from here inshallah inshallah and you guys are doing an incredible job um, Miran it's been an amazing journey to seem likewise I mean Miran you're the brainchild this is your baby um, nurture it until it grows into a fully walking talking Okay, I think well, I the metaphor's know, really gone whack there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I don't know where I'm going with this analogy. You get the point. Um, yeah, but, I, I mean, it's in, it's incredible. And I really, I couldn't have worked with a better team. Walla, you guys are incredible. Every one of you has your own strengths and weaknesses and your own unique qualities. And that's really shone through on the show and on the Y Factor page on Facebook. Um, but I thank you guys for having me on the program, accepting me as a team member, accepting me as leading it at one point in time. And now, as if you want to call me Y Factor alumni, happy to support it in whatever I can, whatever capacity, inshallah, um, in the future. The very thank you first so alumni. much. Jazakallah khair, Muhammad. Thank you, so, thank you for those kind words. Um, and inshallah, we'll see you, on, see you around the Facebook page. Um, and again, thank you so much for all the contributions. No worries. All the best, guys. Right, Thanks so a lot. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was um, Taha, our former host, we can say now. Um, and, you know, it, it is uh, sad to see him go, but we do wish him the very best for the future. Now, we're going to take a very short break. Um, we're going to come back with a very, very interesting segment. We're going to be talking about WikiLeaks, the National um, Security Agency's hacks. And we have a very special guest joining us for that feature. So stay tuned. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. Joining us for this next episode is a very special guest. Now, before we introduce a special guest, let's just have a chat about what the feature is going to be on. Now, for anyone who's been following the news, um, US intelligence agents, according to the CNN, have been hacking computer networks around the world for years, apparently targeting uh, data pipes that push immense amounts of data around the internet. Now, this leak came from um, Edward Snowden, who was a, uh, I guess, he, he was working with... Um, 
he was working with a with the NSA, wasn't it? No, he he was he leaked what the NSA did, right? Um, but I actually forgot who it was with. Tasnim, not on the ball today. Not doing my work properly. However, um, he's actually uh, he's the whistle Yep, he yeah. was he was being formally charged with um, espionage uh, in the United States, and now he's actually um, going ahead uh, to seek asylum in Ecuador. Yes, Ecuador seems to be the favourite place to go for anybody who needs to seek asylum after leaking documents. Julian Assange being the first uh, person to go there. So what we're going to do today in order to explore the Snowden issue and exactly what the consequences of, you know, his situation is for the everyday Australian, um, we're going to be speaking to somebody from Anonymous. Now, if you don't know what Anonymous is, Basically, anyone can be anonymous, as the name suggests. Anonymous has no leader, no ranking, and no single means of communication. They're spread across many mediums and languages, and people join them by simply defending freedom of the internet and freedom of all human beings. So, one of the collective joins us today, and we are going to be calling him Anon because he is anonymous, because that is the point of anonymous. Welcome to the show, Mr. Anon. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's just get started. Why is this um, Snowden uh, story very significant and why has it caused, I guess, reverberations around the world? Yeah, so like as you said um, when you read out that CNN article, for years it's been predicted by many IT experts that due to things, and, and, and it's because of things like the, a decrease in cost of commu- um, computer hardware and an increase in the computing power, that the government agencies would have the ability to capture and store and mine all of our communications across the internet. Snowden has just simply proven this for us and it's essentially a confirmation of a violation of human rights, which is the right for us to have privacy. Basically, we have things the wrong way around. We should have transparency for the state and privacy for the people. Um, and it's worth to mention that um, that on the 13th of June in the House of Senate, Senator WA Scott Ludlam asks Attorney, uh, Attorney General Senator Ludwick if the Australian authorities and agencies are receiving huge volumes of information from the U- United States through warrantless real-time surveillance program PRISM. Um, he ends by asking what, to what degree the Australian government is compli- complicit into this unprecedented intrusion into the private lives and data of ordinary citizens. Each time Lud- Ludlam tries to obtain an answer from Ludwig, he gets blown off with evasive responses like they don't discuss matters of national ex- um, security. The truth of the matter is that there's no proof of their effectiveness. And in reality, this mass surveillance is a potential means of ordinary citizens being implicated and entangled in crimes they haven't committed. Well, the, according to Snowden, he actually um, he says that among 61,000 reported, there are 61,000 reported targets of the National Security um, Agency, right? Now, just to correct myself earlier, he worked for Booz Allen Hamilton, who, what's a, which is a um, computer consulting firm. Obviously, he's been um, fired um, and <laughs> they have charged him with criminal offences and, and they want to take action against him. Yep. Now, my question to you is, and this is, um, I guess, a lot, a lot of times people use this um, to, you know, shut people up who do kind of want to speak about privacy and how important privacy, how important privacy is. You know, if you if you're if you're not doing anything, there's nothing to hide. Why are you worried if you're being, um, you know, monitored, or if you're being watched? What would the response be to that? Well, I mean, do you want someone watching your pri- your communications, like between your partner, for instance? It's, I guess, yeah. um, you know, at the end of the day, we've <coughs> accepted these are uh, legally shrined, you know, um, privacy rights that we all have. But I think increasingly in our society, where we've become somewhat mm. of a, you know, big brother state, yeah. that, you know, people actually do use the argument that, you know, well, if you're not doing anything or, you know, it you're not matter. hiding anything, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I think what we need to kind of take a step back and realise is that these are legally enshrined rights that we have That's to right. privacy and things like that. And the, th- and the thing is, that the, thing, the reason why it's dangerous, and Snowden actually highlights this in his video, the original video that was released, is that they they are able to store this information for so long um, and they can easily, like, so if, if they want to take you down, they can, right? And it can be for whatever reason and they'll find it, they'll find it. Like, they, you know, you, you may just have been talking to someone about something completely unrelated, but they'll they'll be able to implicate you in a crime. You don't know how it will right? be used against Because they've got right. endless access. That's now. right. They've got, yeah. Well, yeah, I wouldn't say endless, but it's a lot, right? The capacity yeah. of storage is tremendous. Right. Well, <clears throat> 
now that we've found this out and, you know, like like we're saying, okay, maybe not endless, but it's still a pretty big deal right mm. there. How does the information that's been revealed affect the average Australian? And most particularly, what should the young people who are, you know, extremely internet obsessed and internet reliant be concerned about as a consequence? Yeah, so it affects anyone um, that uses the internet, regardless of their generation. And basically, we ha- like you said, we have an Orwellian-style surveillance system in place for everything that we do on the internet. So it's a lot of power in the hands of a few people, um, as discussed earlier, and it should be enough to make everyone think about the implications. Um, also, agencies like um, the also intelligence agency of New Zealand, Australia, and USA and allies have been cooperating since the 50s. And it would be naive to think that the same thing wasn't being done within our own um, country. So that's worth worth a... You the know, same thing being like the as monitoring. In, so basically what's happening in the USA right now and with the um, the the surveillance system that's in place mm-hmm. it could be it, it is most probably happening here as well right so we're talking surveillance of you know very commonly used websites such as facebook twitter yeah all of the social media um all of your the online email basically everything that you have an account with and anything and, and yeah anything that you you you'll maintain your personal data on would be do you know this reminds captured. me of a paper i was doing some research last year about um the the filter bubble and basically if you're using google for example mm. you know how you have like google's connected to your gmail or whatever else if you're used to searching for a particular topic area or a particular region then after a while without you even putting these settings on google starts to filter the kind of results mm. that it will give to you so for example i could google sydney now mm. anon could google sydney and you Tasneem, could google the same thing the results that we get will be completely different because it's not a random search anymore it's a search they're going to check what your geographical point is they're going to check what your history of searches is and they'll be searching they'll be basing the search also on personal information that you've submitted time and time again into the um the web browsers that you're using in the email accounts and so on and so forth so even though you know putting it out there that just seems like your search becomes a lot more efficient really what's happening is that over time they're amassing all this information about your habits and your Mm. likes and your preferences and your location like it it zones it down to what suburb you're in but i guess it's down to that double-edged sword where you have these enhancement technologies right where you're potentially for example saving hours of research just because the search is so refined but then at the same time to enable these enhanced technologies they have a lot of data on you right now i guess you know the issue comes down to in any app you use, any internet site you log on, whether it be, you know, the tracking um, cookies that come up with it or whether it be, um, you know, the app permissions that they need or GPS tracking in a globalized world where we do, you know, have our smartphones, internet access, GPS tracking, things like that. It's very, very hard to kind of avoid altogether leaving any sort of digital trace, right? So the concern is that inadvertently we are leaving these traces and the problem is when they're kind of accessed without our permission Um, and I think this is when you know the whole NSA or ASIO or other uh, intelligence agents agencies being basically having access you know whether limited or unrestricted Mm. to our data for a purpose we don't know about without our consent that does lead to a lot of concern yeah so basically that example that um, you used was Google and and that's true like so before this came out I mean, and even though this was already known, Google would have been doing that for advertising purposes and they and they do do that. And, and not that I agree with it, I'm just saying it was for their own agenda, right? But now we're saying that the governments actually are, are you know, getting this data and collecting this data off them. Yeah. So they know as well where you are, what you're doing. If you, if you check in, you know, your, your geographic location with your phone or whatever, they know everything about it, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's all tracked. All right. So... Now that we've established that this is terrible and we need to get rid of it, um, what role does the global citizen play in supporting a whistleblower like Snowden? Yeah, so people need to speak up about this openly and support and, and support Sm- um, Snowden um, and other whistleblowers as well, because don't forget Snowden's not the only one. Of course. Um, uh, people also need to bring to light um, like people who bring to light corruption in our society shouldn't be treated as criminals, um, and it's sad to think that we live in a world where this is so. 
Yeah, think of Julian Assange, who's a fugitive until now. Exactly. And Snowden sort of being put in the same situation. It's funny because in Australia, you know, you sort of have the right to complain about something going wrong in your workplace and you're not supposed to be discriminated against mm. if that's the case. And yet you have something like this with even bigger implications, you know, on a, on a global scale. And mm-hmm. yet they're treated like criminals, just like you've pointed out now. That's right. Well, when you say, you know, speak up and openly support Snowden and so on, what do you think that people should actually be doing, you know, realistically? And and maybe you talk about that from the perspective of being some anonymous from anonymous, again, as non as unhomogenized as that is and undefined, considering that everyone comes with their own, you know, perspective and background. But where does anonymous stand on all of that? So anonymous is always on the side of morals, ethics and justice. And that's what the true message of anonymous is, regardless of what the powers above try to make us think. But basically to everyone, um, you know, to expand on the last thing is, you know, when you're talking to people and they, the Snowden thing comes up, be open about it and just say, you know, even those little interactions with people change people's minds and opinions on things, right? So be open and supportive of, of Snowden mm-hmm. and people like him. So. I guess I'm going to be a devil's advocate or I should say government advocate in this regard. But if we're talking about, I guess, morality and justice and things like that, Anonymous in the past has had a lot of, I guess, hacktivist campaigns. So hacking for an activist purpose, right? Mm. So whether it be, for example, taking down websites, um, Israeli websites when they did launch the offensive into the Gaza Strip, whether it be, um, you know, just generally, you know, banking sites or the fat cats, as they like to call them. There's been a lot of these hacktivists. Um, now, that comes to the issue of legally and from a society perspective, If you, where does law and order go? If you kind of have someone who is outraged or, you know, rightly on, or wrongly so, I'm not, you know, placing a moral judgment on this, right? Someone who's outraged with a cause that you think is pertinent and then takes the law into their own hands um, and, for example, you know, turns into an activist, then if everybody does that, where does that leave, you know, law and order in society I guess so Mm. that would be the argument that a lot of people would play um, in terms of combating I guess you know say the uh, hacktivist techniques of anonymous and otherwise Mm. so the the important thing to remember with anonymous is that there's no leader and there's no there's no um, central way of everyone you know there's no Connected, yeah. uh, apart from um, there is there is a general um, collective, but anyone can become anonymous and do anything under anonymous. So that's where some of the confusion is sometimes as well. But in terms of that, I mean, I would consider that like equivalent of armed armed resistance, right? So um, what happens with regards to websites or hacktivist attacks, like you described earlier, that's like armed resistance for people who are struggling under oppression, right? So yeah, that's the way I view that sort of stuff. So you, personally you, so that's you, a personal opinion yeah, yeah. other anons have their own opinion definitely so yeah. it's kind of like i guess um your way of contributing to i guess an injustice that you see happening that's right by t- physically doing something about it and in that case in that case yeah you know hacking sites yeah and 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 it's worth mentioning that to me like and this is another personal opinion that hack, hacking a website is like graffiti on a wall right so when we're talking about um like cosmetic damage mm. to to property right what about another initiative that anonymous is out with like trolling the nsa yeah so um that's something that we can all do actually not just anonymous which is really good um and it's and we can basically just involve sending communications with keywords in them that Mm -hmm. the nsa would be actually doing their data mining on so like you know whenever you send an email send out some words that would be like you know considered terrorist activity um and then we can just confuse them right so or we could get arrested by ASIO. But how, like, so, I mean, that then you're a martyr. <laughs> Who wants to put their hand up for that cause? <laughs> and it's not that, but basically, how can, you know, you can't arrest everyone for, yeah. for doing this, right? So that's the point of it as well. It's kind of like... But then um, playing devil's advocate the more, again. Yeah, it's creating noise and confusion. Okay, but you're creating noise and confusion. Then how can these, I guess, um, agencies that are there to do a job and, I guess, protect the citizens, do their job efficiently and protect us if they're being trolled? Yeah, but the point, the, the but the thing is we don't agree with all being monitored like this just to protect the citizens. We don't need that, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, the main part of this. With the citizens don't need protection? 
the citizens need protection, but we don't need it like in uh, under By those that, means. Yeah. yeah, I think we. I think it's important to also rethink um, not just the I guess social um, and advocacy framework we're operating in, but sometimes even the legal perspective on things. So, for example, if you know this is actually a legal you know a breach of privacy, can legal action be taken? Um, you know, social action, and I think when you unite social, political, legal action together, that's kind of what leads to change in society. Look, I think we've discussed some very important issues um, in this, and I think there are, as I said, I was playing devil's advocate, but, you know, a lot of you guys would have your views on this. Um, and, and we could know. probably take it till next week with all the du- information that we can discuss about this, but unfortunately we are pretty much out of time. Um, with that, maybe, is there a way that people can track down, you know, things like these initiatives, the Troll the NSA, for example, um, how do people get on board with that? Yeah, so there's, like, we can provide links, um, hopefully, if this gets posted online so yeah. we can post that basically troll the nsa is just troll the nsa.com um you can go there there's a template yeah that's um, easy to remember yeah <laughs> um and then there's also a handbook for people that need to that want to try a- and respect their own privacy and you know how to use the internet in a, in a way that that would do that right so best make it possible. more secure for yourself yeah okay. making it yeah and using it in a, in a smarter way that you know isn't just giving the all the information yeah. out about yourself um, so there's okay, maybe what we can do with that is actually just post the links on our Facebook page then and we'll post it under the, the episode as well when we upload it and that way anyone who's listening to this can just look at the bottom of the play bar and click on the links and follow through that. All right, so we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Mr Anonymous, for coming in and shedding your wisdoms um, in relation to this uh, subject. As I said, episode will be online and would love to hear your comments on this. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. And that was Muna Zela from the AFF, the Arab Film Festival, with Mustafa Rashwani, our co-host. We did have to cut that short because we are running completely out of time, but we will upload the full interview up for you all to have a listen to online um, on YouTube. So keep an eye on the YouTube channel and our Facebook pages, of course. Definitely. Um, now, that brings the episode to a wrap, Miran. I think we've had a very interesting episode. Um, thanks so much to the anonymous member for coming in and uh, speaking about, you know, um, I guess the NSA, the leaks, uh, Snowden and otherwise, I would really love to continue to continue this discussion, right? Because I think there's so many themes and so many aspects that you can actually analyse this situation with and would love to get your thoughts. We're going to have to continue that online though again, which is the fantastic thing about having a Facebook page. But anyway, just to sort of wrap up the episode as well, a reminder um, or, you know, a second farewell, I guess, to our co-host and producer, former producer Mohamed Taha, who's now joined the ABC and will no longer be hosting with us on The Y Factor. Um, best of luck to him. And, you know, we just wanted to mention Amatullah, who is also, you know, one of the founding members of The Y Factor, uh, is no longer with us, you know, but she was listening in today and is a massive supporter of The Y mm-hmm. Factor. And she sent in a message saying, you know, it brings back so many memories and all the best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you success in every step that you take. I mean, I mean and, and Taha did you. say to I do a special shout out and thanks to Amatullah on air. So I think uh, it feels like it's kind of one of those uh, group, oh my God, moments. But I think, you know, as The Y Factor show, we have come a long way. It's been our three, um, Alhamdulillah. you know, mark. But it's without, you know, these invaluable members uh, sorry it's with these invaluable <laughs> members that we get where we are so honestly you know Amatullah we did fa- farewell you a while ago but you know you're still with us and I'm, I'm really glad that you know you do keep in touch with us and you know all the awesome work you're doing for the community Taha you know we do expect that you know very bright journalist career ahead of you and we will we'll settle for nothing less for than you know a globally renowned journalist so um, you know good luck with it and we do ho- wish you the very best and that leaves us I guess Um, With the end of today's episode, it's Thursday, the 27th of June, and um, that brings us right to the end. Tasneem and Miran for The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.